No story in a game has ever stuck with me the same way the story of Final Fantasy IX has. Part of it has to do with my longtime history with the series and owning the game since its release in the US. The other part is because of what Final Fantasy IX is. In many ways, it's a unique entry in the series, but a lot of people would disagree with that statement. There's really nothing that Final Fantasy IX does that other titles in the series haven't already done but Nine's uniqueness comes from how it handles its themes, and it shines really bright once you begin to realize what it does. I, like many others, was introduced to the series through the iconic Final Fantasy VII, and while I love the game, and it holds fond memories for me, it doesn't hold as hard an impact as Nine does. At the same time, I decided to go out of my way and play every main series title, except Eleven, because I was too lazy and... Yeah, that's about the only reason. I really liked 4 and 6, more so than 7, but still, they were nothing compared to 9, and it all comes down to how 9 carries itself and its themes. Existentialism is pretty much a defining theme of Final Fantasy. There's at least one character in every game that questions who they are, why they're living, and what they're meant to do in life. Some stand out more than others, but the ones that stuck out to me were Cecil from 4, Celeste and Terra from 6, though I was always more of a Celeste person, and Titus from 10. All of them are some of my favorite characters from the series because of their development as people, but 9 throws that all away. Kind of. We all remember this moment and what made it emotional. A party member was stripped from us for the first time in the game. She could no longer talk, no longer laugh, no longer cry or get angry. Our fingers were tingling, our mouths were dry, and our eyes were burning. There is a lot to appreciate about Aerith's death scene from Final Fantasy VII, from its music to how it flows directly into a boss battle with no time for the player to recover even if it's not Final Fantasy's first party member death. It was the first many people witnessed, and it being in a visually revolutionary game at the time, only aided in its impact. This was a major turning point in the game's narrative, one that put the existential crisis of Cloud so in your face for the first time when Genova tells him, because you are a puppet. This piece of dialogue, in conjunction with Nibelheim not being as Cloud described it in his story, throws the game into a full-on soul-searching mission for Cloud, while at the same time trying to deal with the threats around him and his friends. But the problem with this scene, at least for me, is while I still feel emotional while listening to the music, the scene in particular has no impact on me anymore. Most of the emotion I do genuinely feel was from the shock of losing a party member that you've spent so long developing. One who, if you raised high enough, had extremely game-breaking limit breaks, and was a huge loss strategically in battle. You see, Final Fantasy IX wasn't so in your face about it, and I think that's why it retains the impact it does on me. The first time you're ever hinted at the overarching existential themes, is in Dali when the party discovers the factory manufacturing black mages for Alexandria. But you see, just how I describe it is the beauty of it. The narrative of this segment is still focused on why Alexandria is making these. As Vivi questions who he truly is, it's a very slowly developing character arc for Vivi. But this scene will always impact me more than Aerith's death. Even if Vivi didn't understand and couldn't communicate with the mages produced in Dali, Black Waltz number 3 just stripped him of the first lead of his origins, the only piece of information he had to go on at that moment was taken from him in an instant, and he enters a trance. 
a surge of emotional power, which works great as a narrative device, but is a really, really clunky game mechanic. After the battle with number three, as he chases the party through Southgate, we see Vivi in shock on the cargo ship, and Zidane goes out to save him during the chase. This is a powerful scene, and it only happens a few hours into the game, but it's only one of many powerful scenes through the whole game, including, but not limited to, Freya's reunion with Sir Freightley and Clara, Steiner and Beatrix's defense of Alexandria, and Zidane teaching Amaranth the meaning of team. Each of the characters faces their own internal struggle, separate from the story at hand, which, for half of the game, we believe is just a political tale of Queen Bronn's lust for power. Some get a longer time dedicated to their issues than others, but none of the events ever overshadow the main story. Every so often we get a small glimpse at a piece of each character's story. Compared to Seven, where most characters are pretty much fully developed by the time you reach their hometowns, or in some cases, recruit them, Nine doesn't end a single character's development until the final scene, even Amaranth and Quinna. I think what really exemplifies this is that the cast of Nine doesn't instantly click together. Steiner, for most of the game, holds a deep negative view of Zidane feeling like he causes problems and does nothing to progress negative situations into positive ones. Amaranth only joins the team to psychoanalyze what makes Zidane a stronger fighter than him, and Quinna is really only in it for the chance to eat different food from around the world. Some of these characters don't even share a common goal, and some can't even stand each other. The story constantly changes between different parties of characters going for different goals. Whether that's Zidane, Vivi, Freya, and Quinna going to check out the problems in Burmesia, or Garnet and Steiner heading back to Alexandria because of their conflict and goals. Zidane is the glue that sticks all of this together, and a protagonist any different from him would have weakened the blow. For example, characters who preceded him in the same era of gaming, such as Cloud and Squall, wouldn't have made this as impactful to me. They're just slightly over-glorified, silent protagonists. Zidane is a goofball, with a distinctive, flirtatious personality, who always cheers his friends up. Despite people not liking him, he still comes to their aid. Despite people having problems he can relate to, he never makes it about himself. Despite being in a fight, he welcomes those looking for their own answers with open arms. Despite falling in love, he never lets that take priority over his real goal. The goal of finding a place to call home. This scene is Final Fantasy IX's version of Aerith's death, except it hits me harder. Everything about Zidane has been positive, and it reminds us that even the most cheerful people can have the lowest lows. What's even more breathtaking is how it brings everything together. Final Fantasy IX is, at its core, a fantasy adventure, one that returned to its roots after the realism of Seven and Eight, one that adopted a more lighthearted and cartoony art style. Yet, despite all of that, it's one of the most relatable stories in the franchise. The cast is so fantastical, from a princess and her knight to an ambiguously gendered gourmand that only thinks about food everywhere they go. At first glance, it looks like it's just another fantasy tale, but when something so fantastical can bring itself down and be so realistic, more so than those that came before it and attempted more realistic approaches, that speaks for itself. The You're Not Alone segment of this game is iconic. Everything, including its music, its dialogue, and its battles, have resonated with people all over the world. It's the one moment in which most of the characters have come to accept who they are and the world around them. Steiner has accepted the truth of Alexandria's past. Vivi has accepted the reality that one day he will stop. Freya has already learned that her lost love no longer remembers her, and Aiko has lost her best friend, Mog. 
Even Zidane had to deal with the reality that Garnett was becoming Queen of Alexandria. But all of those emotions tie together here, as Zidane accepts his reality. After all he did was preach about how sticking together is what matters, and people should help each other, he foregoes all of the practices he preached to keep his friends safe and confront his own truth. Even when they offer him the help, he pushes them aside saying they wouldn't understand how he feels, and he can handle it on his own, but they all stand by his side, reminding him of what he taught each and every one of them, and that he's a better person than this. It's Zidane's time to be helped. Sometimes, we don't want to accept the help of others because it makes us feel weaker as a single, individual person. We want to be strong. We want to fix our own issues, even if we don't know how. With knowing what this game has in store in its future, when you replay through the earlier segments, you can just see how slowly everything actually progresses, and how it works to its advantage. How using the ideas of leaning on your friends and putting trust in those you may not like or agree with can be good for you, or those around you, turns into a story about even the strongest men falling to the weakest lows. That's not to say that Nine doesn't have its faults. It has many. There's the aforementioned trance system, Garland's exposition dump near the end of disc 3, and Square not making Beatrix a core party member. Okay, maybe that one is just me wishing for something. Final Fantasy IX, even on my most recent playthrough, tugged at my heart. More so than recent playthroughs of 6 or 7 have, and that's because of how it's structured, how it carries itself. It's a beautiful piece that reflects its themes in different ways, constantly through the game, while hiding behind a mask before it shows you its true intentions. Lord Avon's I Want to Be Your Canary is essentially a digest of the game's love story and how it progresses. Shown at both the beginning and the end, Kuja's references to his play in each act strengthen the connection to Nine's story in Avon's play. I can keep talking about this game forever, but I think I've talked about why this game is so special enough. Next time you play through your favorite Final Fantasy game, or really any game, think about what makes it stand out from the rest, especially if it's part of a series that tends to have many similar games in it. If you just sit and look at it, sometimes the things you'll find will impress you even more. I want to thank those that have pledged to me on Patreon, especially Justin Shipman, 